in our study of the conflict of the ages, and we're looking at Satan's offensive strategy against believers, and we've been noting how Satan likes to discourage believers from being occupied with Jesus Christ. And we saw how he... And to be occupied with Christ means to be focused on God's plan, upon God's word, what the Bible tells us. And what the devil wants to do is he wants to get our mind focused. We looked at on self or get our mind focused on people. And in this study, we're looking at how Satan wants to get our minds focused on our circumstances. He wants us to look at our circumstances, not to focus on God's word. He wants us to be focused and concentrating on whatever we're facing, whatever the situation is, whatever the problem is or in our life, rather than focusing upon what God has promised us. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to look at it through the life of David. But first of all, I'd just like to review some principles. So if we could put our first one up on the board, and we'll go through these. Satan encourages believers to get their eyes focused on their circumstances. You know, Satan likes to encourage us to do the wrong thing, right? <laughs> get our eyes on our circumstances. Look at how bad things are. Or how, you know, things could be better. The grass is green around the other side, etc. But this is the satanic trap of believing the grass is green around the other side. Believers who are occupied with this circumstance instead of the Lord Jesus. Move forward. Christ, I never truly content and happy. They are distracted from God's plan by their circumstances. You know, a lot of people look at their life and they say, you know, if I only made this choice instead of that choice, oh, I would be so much happier. I'd be so much more content. If I had this job instead of that job, my life would be happy. I'd be more content. If I met this girl instead of that girl or that guy instead of this guy, oh, my life would be so much better. And really, that's not the truth because we're going to see that happiness doesn't depend on outward circumstances. That true happiness and contentment depends on our focus on Jesus Christ and his word and executing his plan because his plan is greater than any circumstance that we will ever face. And many times God allows the circumstances we're in because he's going to use them as a test to grow us up, to train us, to change us, and to prepare us for something greater. And we may look at the circumstance and say, how could that be? But the truth is God's plan is greater, and he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, and we're going to see tonight in David's life, at probably, uh, David had a lot of low points. I would say this might have been the lowest, what we're going to look at tonight, the rebellion of his son Absalom, and how out of the ashes of that, how David handled it and wrote Psalm 23, which is a great psalm of encouragement to what? Every believer down through the centuries. Um, our next point, please. Occupation with one's circumstances causes a believer to ignore God's plan. Whatever circumstance you're in, it doesn't take God by surprise. It might take you by surprise. It might shock you, but guess what? God knew all about it. In fact, he knew all about it way back yonder when there was nothing except Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And the good news is God has a solution to your problem, to your circumstance. And God has given us a plan. He says, now what are you going to do? Are you going to... You're going to focus on self, on people. You're going to get angry. You're going to get bitter. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get full of fear and worry and anxiety. Get distracted from my plan. Are you going to focus on the circumstances and say, oh, throw up your hands and say there's no hope? Or are you going to realize that I gave you a plan? Just keep following my plan because I cause all things to work together for good. And the bird with the broken wing can fly higher than he or she ever flew before. So occupation with one's circumstances causes a believer to ignore God's plan. And that's what Satan wants. Forget about the word. Forget about the church. Forget about the promises. Forget about the doctrines. Forget about the principles. Forget about prayer. Forget about claiming the promises. Forget about walking in the Lord's will. And just focus on the circumstance. Bible doctrine in the soul right here. 
in our thinking and leads to a life of turmoil, frustration, instability, and discontentment. You'll never be content and happy ignoring God's plan if you're a Christian. There's pleasure for a season outside of God's plan, but it doesn't last. Next point. Circumstance and environment are not the key to happiness and contentment. People think, uh, you know, I'll just leave uh, Rhode Island and I'll move to Florida. <laughs> Better weather. And I'll be happy. No, if you're miserable here, you'll be miserable in Florida. Maybe the only good thing will be you'll be miserable in better weather, but you're still going to be miserable because happiness does not depend on circumstances or environment. Adam and Eve had perfect environment in the garden, and each one of them had the right spouse. If anybody got the right woman, it was Adam. If anybody ever got the right man, it was Eve, right? And they had perfect environment as well as Bible doctrine taught by who? The Lord Jesus Christ, every evening, he would come and walk in the garden and teach them his word face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. You want a better Bible teacher? So they had the best Bible teacher ever. They had a perfect environment. They had the perfect man for, it, for her and the perfect woman for him. And guess what? They became discontented. You see, they thought there was something better. Eve, listen to Satan, who said, There's something what? Better. There's something better. God's holding this against you. He's. He's, he's keeping something good from you. Go ahead, eat, because if you eat, God knows, then you'll be like him. You see, and her whole thought pattern got distracted, and what, what was he telling her? Satan was basically saying, there's something better out there. And was there? No. They were in perfect environment. All right, yet they blew it all because Eve became dissatisfied with what God had provided and accepted Satan's lies and offer of something better. So let's move forward. Our next principle. Now, to the arrogant and unregenerate unbeliever, to the unbeliever and arrogance and the carnal, arrogant carnal believer that rejects God's plan, God's authority and God's plan is an unbearable yoke. But to a maturing, positive believer, God's authority and plan is not grievous, but an easy yoke. The Bible says his commandments are not what? Grievous. And Jesus said, come unto me, all you that are what? Burdened and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you, which means, what does it mean to take the yoke? It means to submit to his what? Will. To accept his authority over your life. To let him run your life. To let him be in charge of your life. To let him make the decisions for your life. Let him to direct you by his word, to direct your paths. And it's not grievous, but it's an easy yoke. He said, my, my yoke is easy and my burden is what? Light. Okay? Next point, please. So where does this lead us? Our final point of review. The only environment that changes life and produces tranquility, peace, happiness, and consistent contentment is in our what? Soul. This is the environment that is the only one that consistently produces what? Tranquility, peace, happiness, and contentment. It's right here. It's the thinking that you have in your soul. What you think determines your happiness. And if you have the Word of God here, and you are nourishing your relationship with Jesus Christ by standing upon His Word and executing His plan, you have a place of perfect peace. The Bible says He will keep us in perfect peace, the one whose mind is stayed on Him. Thou shalt keep Him in perfect peace, the one whose mind is stayed on thee. In other words, the perfect environment... Listen, there's no perfect environment on planet Earth. People think, well, if I had a bigger home, more money, a nicer car, a better job, if I, if I had a beautiful wife or a handsome husband, or, oh, a big family, a lot of kids, whatever people think, you know, if I could travel the world. And people have that. And, the, and they're the most miserable people in the world. And they commit suicide and they're on all kinds of medications. And they're unhappy and dysfunctional. Why? Because the outward environment cannot produce happiness. A little pleasure for a season, but not lasting tranquility, peace, and contentment. Because you can have the biggest, beautifulest house in the world, the most beautiful wife or handsomest husband, great children, great job. And then the doctor tells you, you know what? You've got a serious illness and it could be fatal. Guess what? 
All that, an outward environment, cannot carry you through. The only thing that can carry you through is what? The inward environment of what's in here, in your soul, and the doctrines there in that personal relationship with Jesus Christ that says, I know he loves me, he's forgiven me, he's with me, he's never going to leave me, and I'm going to stand upon his word, and whatever's happening in my life, I'm not going to let it stop me from exercising and, uh, my will to execute his what? Plan. Because if I just keep following his plan, he will work it all out for good. Do you hear me tonight? Because God's plan is greater than any circumstance. And so listen, the, don't think, oh, if I just change everything in my life, I'll be happy. No, you won't. Here's what needs to change. Get it right here. Paul rejoiced from a Roman prison cell. He said in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Why? Because Paul understood God's plan for his life was greater than the circumstance he was facing. And Jesus Christ was his best friend. He understood the plan of God. He understood the promises and the word of God and the principles of God's word. And he was standing on that. And he knew where he was headed. His eternal destiny was to be with the Lord forever. And he knew God was with him and had his hand on him and nothing could touch him unless God allowed it. And if God allowed it, God had a solution. And sometimes God puts us in some tough circumstances to test everything we learned and everything that we say we believe. And now we have to actually really what? Trust him and keep executing his plan so that we can see him fulfill his purpose for us and prove to us that we don't have to fear anything because he's with us. When you go through something hard and you trust God, even though you have to struggle and it hurts, and it's not the best of circumstances, but when you trust God and you believe what God says and you keep plugging, you keep doing what he told you, you keep executing his plan and you get through it, then you know that you know that you know that you can rely on him. He proves himself faithful to you personally. And once that happens, life changes, and you'll never be the same again. You'll never be the same again. Because you know, wow, I was in a difficult place, a tough place. And I kept doing what God told me to do. And I kept believing him. And it wasn't easy, but he gave me grace, and I got through. And then it all worked out. And God proved himself faithful to who? Me, personally. And now I know he's with me and he's got my back. And I don't have to fear anything from this point forward. You're getting the picture here. And uh, I want to look tonight at the example of David in David's life. If you'll turn to me to 2 Samuel, chapter 15, I want to begin. Uh, we're going to look at verse... 10 to 14, we're going to begin there. And with the situation that we're looking at, we have to uh, give you the background of it first, is the situation of Absalom's rebellion. Absalom was David's beloved son. Beloved son. And he was a handsome, strong young man of tremendous ability and personality and charismatic. And many people took to him and loved him and liked him. And, and David and him had a riff. And to make a long story short, uh, Absalom became bitter against his dad. And his dad handled it the wrong way, David. A great man, but great men are not always what? Wise, it says in Job chapter 12, right? We're all human. Great men are not always wise. And instead of, you know, forgiving Absalom and encouraging him and let him know, look, it's done, it's over, it, I forgive you, and my son. And he loved Absalom. He loved Absalom probably more than any of his other children. And yet Absalom plotted with the enemies of David to take over the throne and to take the kingdom away from David. And this, this is a tragedy in David's life. And we're going to see that in one of the darkest hours of David's life, 
David would face a set of circumstances that would have caused most of us to panic, to be full of fear, to be full of depression. And yet, we're going to see in that time, David handled it magnificently. He grieved, he wept, but he kept what? Going. He was hurting, his heart was broken, but he kept going. He kept going forward. And he penned Psalm 23 in that time where he was recalling all the truth and all the doctrines that he had learned, all the principles that he had learned from God and God's word over the years. And it sustained him through that time magnificently. Now turn to me uh, in uh, 2 Samuel 15. Look at verses 10 to 14. So Absalom led a rebellion, a conspiracy that would leave David shocked and it would have to cause David to have to flee from Jerusalem out across the brook Kidron, out into the wilderness. In verse 10 it says, But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And there was a coup d'etat about to take place. He had already plotted with many people. He had set up a network of people and connections that he knew were with him, who understood what was going to happen, and, and they were just waiting for the right what signal to begin the coup d'etat, the conspiracy to take the kingdom from his father. In verse 11 it says, And with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called, and they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel. Now Ahithophel was one of David's sworn enemies, but David didn't realize it. It was a man that David trusted. It was Bathsheba's grandfather. And he never got over what happened when David, what, committed adultery with Bathsheba, and the baby was lost. And Uriah was what? Killed in battle because of David's what? Orders. And he held it against David and he never got over it and he waited for the right time to take revenge. He acted as if he was David's friend, but his heart was full of what? Bitterness. And he went along with what? David's son Absalom. Two bitter people, full of revenge, full of vindictiveness and hatred, and they plotted to take the kingdom from King David. And it says, uh, and Absalom sent for Ahithophel the Gilanite, David's counselor. In fact, he had been so close to David that he was one of his top advisors. Okay? From his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. And Absalom built momentum. It started small. But he continued to build momentum and he gained what? The multitudes who were with him. And he became strong enough to where now he could what? Usurp the throne from his father. In verse 13, and there came a messenger to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. David becomes aware of what's happening, this conspiracy to take the kingdom. And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. So David recognized that he was not prepared to put down this revolt, this conspiracy, this coup d'etat. He, was, he was, had not readied his men and his forces to handle the might and the strength that Ahithophel and Absalom had built up. And he knew that there was only one thing to do, he, to, to preserve his life and the lives of those that were with him in the palace. He had to what? Flee. He became a refugee. And he had to flee from Jerusalem. Um, and at this time, many of David's friends had abandoned him and had betrayed him. They, they were turncoats. He had treated them well. He had provided for him, he, them. He had defended them. He had loved them. And they betrayed him. 
And his beloved son led a rebellion to take the kingdom. But not just that, he plotted with Ahithophel to murder his own father, to assassinate him. Think about that. The son that he loved so dearly and cared for, the, the person that he loved so much and so and the most in the world was betraying him and plotting to destroy him. You see? And uh, David was in a place where he probably was at his lowest point and he had to flee. He had to flee the palace in Jerusalem and he had to go into the wilderness and all David had with him at that time was his sword and a relative handful of faithful followers who came with him, faithful followers. And uh, obviously, he had who? The Lord. Because the Lord promised, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Now, if you think about that, this was, this was a, a, a grievous situation, uh, a terrible moment in David's life. He had appeared to have lost everything. He appeared to have lost everything. His crown, his throne, his wealth, his friends, his loved ones, his beloved son Absalom. But in reality, David had really lost nothing. Because if you have the Lord, you have everything you need for time and eternity. If you have the Lord and you have doctrine here and you know what he's promised you, then you have everything you need to handle any situation. You see, and David had lost nothing because he could draw upon the great resources of the principles and the promises and the doctrines of the word of God that he had learned and believed and stored what? Right here in his soul, his thinking, uh, his outward environment, was full of grief and crisis and problems and pain and heartache. But his inward environment was one of what? Peace and contentment because he knew the Lord's word. And uh, while he was sitting alone at some point, he wrote Psalm 23. Actually, he was at a place called Maenaim. We'll look at that in a moment. Well, let's look at, if you'll take 2 Samuel 15, and when you get time, we, we can't get through the whole passage, obviously, the whole, all these passages tonight, but read it. 2 Samuel 15 to 18, it's the whole story of the Absalom rebellion. But go to verses 23 to 26. And so they begin to, they begin to flee as refugees. They're heading out to the wilderness. Everything seems lost at this point. And all the country, verse 23, wept with a loud voice. And all the people passed over. The king also himself passed over the brook Kidron. And all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. Just imagine that picture in your mind. Leaving behind everything that you had, what, cherished and loved and lived for. And heading out to an unknown, uncertain future. Think about it. And then to know that the people that you loved and the, and the one person you loved the most had betrayed you. Think about how David felt at that time. You put yourself in that place. Imagine what it was like. This is a dark, dark period. And yet David's going to handle it magnificently. Look at verse 24. And lo, Zadok also, and all the Levites were with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And of course, in those days, to take the ark with them, they understood that the ark was the presence of God, and you know they wanted the presence of God with them in the sense of the ark. But David's going to say, no, send it back to where it belongs. Send it back to where it belongs. And look here. <laughs> He said, bearing the ark of the covenant of God, and they set down the ark of God, and Abiathar went up until all the people had done passing out of the city. And the king said to Zadok, carry back the ark. 
of God into the city. Now listen. Listen to what this man says at this moment. Your son wants to assassinate you. Your, your trusted advisor has plotted revenge against you and is in on the assassination attempt. There's, there's a coup d'etat. They're taking the kingdom from you. And they're taking everything you had owned and everything you had cherished from you. And he says, carry back the ark of God into the city. If I shall find favor, grace, that word favor, if I shall find grace. David knew that he didn't deserve anything from God. Oftentimes we think, well, I'm, I'm a good husband, I'm a good father, I'm a good son, I'm a good daughter, you know, I'm a good uh, Christian, I'm, I'm good, and I've done this and I've done that. You know, I, I deserve better. And the truth of the matter is none of us deserve anything except judgment. We're all sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And David, at this point, says something. He says, if I shall find favor. But you know what the great news is? We don't deserve anything from God, yet in magnificent love and matchless grace and mercy, God does for us what we can never do for ourselves. And God gives us promises. And God tells us, I love you, I forgive you, and I'm with you, and I'm going to take care of you, and just trust me, I'm going to work everything out for good. And it's not because of how wonderful you and I are, because we are not. If we got what we deserve, we'd all be in a devil's hell for all eternity. But we, David says, if I find grace, favor in his eyes, it says, he will bring me again and show me both it in his habitation. In other words, take it back. If God shows me grace, he's going to bring me back to the throne and I'll see the ark again. I'll live to see it. I'm going to get through this by God's grace if God gives me grace. And he wasn't being cocky or arrogant saying God had to do all this, but he, he was relying upon God's grace and God's mercy. And look at verse 26. But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here am I. Let him do to me as seemeth good unto him. Now, you say, well, that doesn't seem to be very confident in God. No, well, that's great confidence in God. See, because David cast him, here's a terrible circumstance in his life, and David can't fix it, but he knows who can, God. The Lord Jesus Christ can fix it because he controls everything. This is a horrible circumstance. This is a nightmare. This is nothing but pain and heartache and uncertainty. And there's nothing I can do. I am, what, I, what does David say? I am casting myself upon God's grace and mercy. And God will do what is right and what is best and what is good. Now, there's great comfort because here David is, he is, this is an act of humility. It's not like these phony preachers on TV, you know, just have faith, name it, claim it, and just keep saying it and you'll get what you want. And people who think because you have faith, everything always works out the way you want. Listen, life doesn't always go the way we want just because we have faith. This is the devil's world. It's a fallen world. People have old sin natures. They do things wrong. People with old sin natures turned on David and betrayed him. But you know what David said? Ultimately, guess what? Who's in control? God. Ultimately, God's in control. And here's what he said. Let him do as seemeth good unto him. In other words, David said, I am putting myself in God's hands. I am casting myself upon the mercy of God. Whatever his will is, I accept it because he will work it for the best and for good. Now that's faith. Faith doesn't always say I'm going to get what I want. Faith says I'm going to get what God said is what good and best. I, I want what he wants. And when we can look at our circumstance and say, Lord, it's painful, it's hard, it's a nightmare and I can't fix it. But here I am, Lord. I am your child. And I'm casting myself on your grace and your mercy. 
and I want your will. Whatever your will is, Lord, that's what I want. Come what may. And that's what David did. And this is a, a fantastic thing. And, you know, look here, if, if you will, at uh, verse 30. And as they passed over, now did that mean that David, you know, was jumping for joy over what happened? No. He was hurting. He was grieving it. He's human. It's okay to grieve, but it's not okay to what? Blame God. And it's never right to turn away from God's plan and give in to the devil and his lies. Okay? Nothing good ever, it only complicates a bad situation. It makes a bad situation worse. I've often wondered, you know, why people, I've seen people who go through horrible trials and yet they still keep executing God's plan and they get through it. And then I see people go through horrible trials and they kind of, they just kind of vanish. You know, and they, they turn everything off. And I understand it. There's pain, there's hurt. But here's the thing. Well, we're going to have some of those moments, but when we come to the realization that, guess what? There's only, there's only one way that works. It's God's way. And yeah, Lord, it's painful, it hurts, but you know what? Where else can I go? An old, an old uh, gospel song says, And where could I go but to the Lord? Right? Peter, when the disciples were going to walk away because things were getting hot and they started to walk away, J Jesus said to the apostles, you guys leaving too? And Peter said, you know, for once he got it right, right? Didn't put his foot in his mouth. He said, Lord, where are we going to go? To whom shall we go? Thou alone has the words of eternal life. In other words, it's your plan or nothing, Lord. <laughs> but that's a good place to be. It doesn't mean we got to understand everything and have all the answers. It doesn't mean we got to feel great about it. But we're wise enough to know that it's the only way that's going to work. And we put it, here I am, Lord, I'm in your hands, I want your will. Look at verse 30. And David went up by the ascent of the Mount Olivet, and he wept as he went up. He's crying. As he's leaving and leaving everything behind and going into the wilderness, he's weeping. And had his head covered, and he went barefoot. And this is, what he's doing is a sign of what? Mourning. His head is covered. He's barefoot. And all the people that was with him covered every man his head, and they went up weeping as they went. They're heartbroken. They're crying. Right? They're grieving. But David is casting himself still. In all that, he's what? Cast himself upon who? God in the grace of God and the mercy of God. Do you understand it? Now go with me, if you will, uh, over to 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 24. 2 Samuel 17, verse 24. Now, a lot transpires. That's why I want you to read. I don't have time to read every verse tonight. But read the whole passage, 2 Samuel 15 to 18. And a lot transpires, and Ahithophel gives advice to uh, Absalom, which would have been the best thing to do and would have led to the death, of, well, not the best thing to do from Absalom and Ahithophel's perspective, right? Would have led to the death of David. Pursue him quickly right away before he gets out there, and, you know, you're stronger, wipe him out. And Ahithophel says, give me the men and I'll do it. You don't even have to come, Absalom. But then uh, Hushai, who is a friend of David, who David left behind and said, hey, you go behind and you be my ears and my eyes. You tell me what's going on. You warn me. And uh, you know, basically give bad advice <laughs> to them. Right? So he was a, a double agent. He was really working for David, but he's acting like he's working for who? Absalom and Ahithophel. So you read it. But anyways, uh, and Absalom ignores an answer to David's prayer to confuse the, you know, the uh, advice of Ahithophel to Absalom. Absalom ignores the advice of Ahithophel that would have led to what? The death of David. And he listens to Hushi, 
And uh, what happens is he goes out to pursue David. David gets the word. A couple of spies come back and tell him who are friendly with David and his men. And they tell him what's going on. And now he's prepared. And the army is prepared. And uh, they're getting ready to go out. David is at a place called Maenaim. Okay? And that's where we're at. And let's look at verse number 24 in 2 Samuel chapter 17. And here's where David writes the psalm that we're going to read. Psalm 23. And in verse number 24, it says, And David came to Maenam, and Absalom passed over Jordan. Now he's in pursuit of David. He and all the men of Israel with him he took the wrong advice. From David's perspective, he took the right advice. And Absalom made Amasa captain of the host instead of Joab. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And which Amasa was a man's son whose name was Ithra, an Israelite that went into Abigail, the daughter of Nasha, Nahash, sister to Zariah, Job, Joab's mother. So Israel and Absalom pinch, pitched in the land of Gilead. And it came to pass when David was come to Maenaim that Shobi, the son of Nahash of Rabbah of the children of Ammon and Machir the son of Amiel of Lodibah and Basilai the Gileadite of Rogalim. They brought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and parched corn and beans and lentils and parched pulse. Listen, an army can't fight if they're hungry, right? The old adage is an army marches on its what? Stomach, right? And yet God knowing David's plight and the plight of his men and knowing that there was what? There was going to be a conflict, all right, and that they were going to engage the army of Absalom very soon. And in the meantime, Ahithophel, when he found out that Absalom didn't take his advice, went home, back to his what? Ranch, got all his house in order, and then went and hung himself because he knew at that point they didn't listen to me. David and his men are valiant, mighty men of what? War and valor. They had a chance to take David while he was weak, but they gave him too much time. Now he's going to be prepared, and David's going to win the battle, and uh, he's going to kill me for treason. So I may as well just get my house in order and kill myself right now, and that's what he did. Okay? Okay? And you get over here, but now this... This fellow comes and he, he brings all this. He got logistical grace. They didn't have any of this stuff. They've been traveling for days and days. They're tired. They're hungry. They're weary. And yet God out of what? Nowhere. It says that Shobi comes with all the things, all the provisions they need. What's the teach us? Logistical grace support. My God shall supply all your needs. You may be in a circumstance that I don't know how I'm going to do it. God knows. God knows. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And he gets every provision. The army gets every provision they need. In verse 29, and honey and butter and sheep and cheese of kind for David and for the people that were with him to eat so they could be strong again. They could, so they could conduct this battle, right? For they said, the people is hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. And David numbered, so now they eat and they, they regain their strength. David is a military man, so he begins to organize what? The units to prepare for what? Battle. The battle is going to be engaged soon with Absalom. He's gotten word that Absalom is on his trail. And he's going to engage them. And he's preparing the units. And David numbered the people that were with them and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. So by now, many of the people had left and followed David. At the initial time that he left, he probably had 600 people. But now there are thousands. See, God is what? Turning the what? Tide. God is turning the tide. David it, it just kept trusting the Lord and following the Lord's plan. And now the tide is turning. The circumstances are changing in David's favor. In verse 2, And David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab, his trusted general, and a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zuriah, Joab's brother, and a third part under the hand of Ittai, the Gittite, who was a loyal friend of David. 
And the king said unto the people, I will surely go forth with you myself also. David said, I'm going with you. I won't send you out there to fight for me unless I'm with you and I lead you. But the people answered, Thou shalt not go forth, for if we flee away, they will not care for us. Neither if half of us die will they care for us. But now thou art worth 10,000 of us. Therefore now it is better that thou succor or help us out of the city. No, you stay here because if you come, they're going to be looking for you to kill you. And you're our king. You're the Lord's anointed. You're the Lord's chosen. You stay here. We'll go to the battle. And, and you can direct things from the city. So obviously they would be in contact with him at Maenam. And then in verse 4, And the king said unto them, What seemeth you best I will do? And David's a humble man. He wasn't arrogant. He, he listened and he took their advice. He, and listen, there are going to be circumstances in life where that are hard and painful and difficult, but the Lord will put, the Lord will provide what you need as far as, you know, your substance, your physical needs, but the Lord will also provide the, the word that you need from, from the Bible, and he'll also provide people to help you. You understand that? And, but you've got to be humble enough to what? To listen. You've got to be humble enough to accept the help. And David was humble enough to realize, let me take the advice of these men who are trusted men whom God has put in my life. Okay, God will put people in your life to help you in those circumstances. That's God's grace. That's his provision. His logistical grace provision isn't just food and clothing. It's, it's people that care. Okay? And then it says in uh, verse number 5, And the king commanded Joab and Abishai Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Absalom. So the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was in the wood of Ephraim. Now, I've got 10 minutes. I want you to turn to Psalm 23 now. If you read the whole story, you will realize that David was triumphant, and Absalom fled. And David had given an order, don't, don't harm Absalom, don't harm him. But Joab, who was David's general, and Zariah, his brother, they were, these were hard men, okay? And they were also not very uh, sympathetic about people that would try to be treasonous to the king. And they didn't let Absalom live. And it broke David's heart. And David wept, Absalom, Absalom, my son. And he wept and he wept and he wept till he could weep no more. But you can read that story. But here's the thing I want to know. David came through this situation and this circumstance victoriously they won the battle he regained the throne but I want you to turn to Psalm 23 because let's back up now we just read how they're about to go out to the battle and at this point everything is still what in the balance right the kingdom is hanging in the balance will Absalom prevail with his armies or would David prevail? Now, Ahithophel knew, because he knew the plan. But at this point, it's still in the balance. And anything can happen on the battlefield. But of course, the Lord gave David favor, and they would what? Be victorious. But as they're heading out, David is sitting back at Maenam. Now he's truly alone. He can't control this circumstance. Just think about this. The battle is on now. The armies are going to meet on the battlefield. Joab, Zariah leading the men, Ittai against Absalom and his armies. And David is left behind and he's alone at Maenam. 
There's nothing he can do to help this circumstance. He's alone, and everything is up in the air. Can you imagine? Most of us would be pacing and sweating and worrying is all what? Heck, right? We'd be a lot of us in that circumstance, right? Hopefully, maybe someday we'd grow enough where we wouldn't, but... David had learned enough about the Lord and his faith was strong enough and he understood God's word and God's plan that David doesn't worry. He doesn't say what's going to happen to my armies and suppose they're ki all killed and defeated and I lose the whole kingdom for good and they'll be hunting me down again like Saul tried to do to kill me and assassinate me. At this age, do I got to go through all that over all over again? And instead of being full of worry and fear and anxiety and feeling sorry for himself and having a pity party and getting angry and upset, he sits down and he picks up a pen, well, a writing tool, <laughs> and he writes what? Psalm 23. Can you imagine this? So when you read Psalm 23 from now on, you remember this is written by David at Maenam when his whole world had what? Fallen apart. And his heart was broken and he was full of grief and sorrow. And the kingdom was what? In the balance. Which way is it going to go? The battle's taking place. It's far away. I don't know what's happening. But he knew that the Lord was his what? Shepherd. Do you understand? Let's read, and we'll close here tonight. This is magnificent. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's sitting at May and A.M. And the first thing he recalls, now what does he do? He does what we need to do when we're faced with hard and painful circumstances. Don't look at people. Don't look at yourself and have a pity party. That will get you nowhere. Yes, you may be grieving, but don't focus on the circumstance. Begin, get alone with God and begin to recall everything that you have learned about the Lord and what he's promised to you. And David says, the Lord is my shepherd. He's the one who's leading, guiding me, protecting me. I shall not want. In other words, he goes back to the whole great truth of logistical grace. He says... God is responsible for me. And here's the great truth. Whatever circumstance we're in, we belong to Jesus Christ. He is our shepherd. He is responsible for us. He will care for you and for me. And he will give us everything we need to survive, to be sustained, and to be successful in whatever the circumstance is that we're facing. Please hear me on this. We're the sheep of his pasture. And he recalls the Lord's what? Logistical grace support. The Lord's going to provide everything that I need. This is as the battle is what? Being engaged. And then he says in verse 2, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me by the still waters. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He begins to recall God's faithfulness because when a, he's basically saying, when I tend to go astray, people think, well, he must be laying down on a nice bunch of grass and flowers that smell good. No, it's the picture of what the shepherd does to the sheep. When the sheep keeps running away, what a shepherd will do is take him and injure the little leg. Actually injure it. It'll heal. But gently injure the little leg so that now the sheep can't want run off. He has to actually lie down in the pasture and stay with the shepherd. You get the picture? We tend, when circumstances get tough, we tend to want to run away from the circumstance, run away from the Lord.